Okay, good morning everybody and Hazaka Baruch Shavua Tov. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Monday morning. Today's class has been sponsored anonymously for the Refuah Shelema of all of Am Yisrael. Rabotai, uh, here we are in new perasha, new week. Perashat Ki Tetze. Perashat Ki Tetze. Ki Tetze means when you will go out. Perasha speaks about when we go out to war and it tells us about different um, interesting halachot um, about women that we find uh, while fighting the enemy. Okay? Uh, if you want to marry her, certain um, leniencies that the Torah actually has for a soldier who was out in battle to have his way with these beautiful women that sometimes they would find that the enemy would actually place on purpose to lure the men and distract them from the battle. Um, without getting too much into the detail of what's going on over here, um, I want to actually go to just a few psukim into the perasha. The pasuk tells us about the very famous um, and difficult halakha to understand. This is going to be in chapter 21, pasuk 18. Ki hiye le'ish ben sorer umore. The famous episode of the wayward child. I am sure we all are familiar with this. Every time we read it, we are bothered. How can it be? Here is, just to read the Psukim rather quickly, the Torah says, If there is a wayward and rebellious son who doesn't heed the voice of his father and the voice of his mother, and they discipline him, but he does not hearken to them, then his father and mother shall grasp him and take him to the elders of the city and the gate of his place. They shall say, This son of ours is wayward and rebellious. He does not hearken to our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall pelt him with stones and he shall die. Unbelievable. Can you imagine? A little kid, 13 year old kid. Okay, he can't even cross the street by himself, maybe. Unless you're in Israel and he could cross already from four years old. But um, this is the Ben Sorer Umore. And we're stoning this kid because. He's already going down the wrong path. This is something that's, of course, very hard for us to understand. Now, the truth is, the Gemara even does say, to be fair, Ben Sorer Umore Lo Haya Velo Yihie. This case of this child, how many times in history, who knows, did this happen? Anyone want to take a guess? How many times did we actually kill a child? It wasn't so common. Who wants to take a guess how many times? If you said one, sorry to tell you, you're incorrect. The answer is zero. Never happened. Lo haya velo yihye. It never happened and it never will happen. Okay? So, and again, the reason is very obvious. The parents have to have themselves say... We are, we give up on him. We want, if the parents forgive, if the parents forgive, you should know, then the kid is actually innocent. Then we don't kill him. So that's why most of the time the parents forgive. But the obvious question is then, if it never happened, then why write it? If it's not something that we can learn from, if it's not something that we'll ever need, then why are you wasting ink in the Torah? Good question? Good question. And the Gemara's answer is remarkable. The Gemara's answer is, Derosh Vekabel Sachar. You know why we wrote it? So that you can read and study and then reap benefits. By reading about it and learning about it, you'll get rewarded. Right now, we're all learning, right? Are we all learning right now? We're all learning Torah. If you're listening to me, I'm not sure who's listening. I hope you're all listening. Okay? Even 90% I'll take. But I'm assuming you're all listening. And if we're all listening, those that are learning right now with me, we're all getting sachar. Okay, so the Gemara is very clear. Because the Torah wrote about this episode, we're learning about it. It's not relevant. It's not practical. It will never be practical or relevant. But at least we're getting reward for learning about it. Because it's in the Torah. We're studying Torah. So everyone, right now, you have finished. Go to your diaries. And you could put in your did I look, Talmud Torah today. Check. Check the box today of learning Torah. Okay? And 
again, this is hard to understand. Because what would Rabbi Mizrahi do if there was no Ben Tzorer Umore in the Perasha? So I would give you a class on the other dozens of mitzvot that are in this Perasha. I mean, this is not a Perasha that you have a hard time giving a Shi'ur on. If, if you're a Rabbi, this Perasha, it's actually the opposite problem. You don't know where to begin. There's so many mitzvot. I think this is the Perasha that has the most mitzvot in the Torah. Okay? I think we would, have a, we would be okay if Hashem would have just left out a few psukim. I would have, there would be enough content and material to give classes on. Okay? Returning lost objects and uh, not wearing shatnes, men wearing a lady's clothing, sending the mother from the nest, fences, tzitzit. I mean, there's so, every other pasuk, adultery, there's so many pesukim in this perasha, each one is literally another mitzvah. Very hard to uh, summarize this perasha, you can't summarize it because there's no summary. It's just a bunch of mitzvot. If there was only 612 mitzvot, if Hashem left out ben soreru more, I think we would still be okay. I think we would still have our hands full. Raise your hand, I don't know, maybe, maybe you guys. Anyone here have a problem? That they, that they finished learning all the Torah? They ran out of stuff to learn? Not yet, right? I think we, I don't think anyone here will ever run into that problem. I think we'll always have what to learn. Hacham Uvadiyah had what to learn his entire life. If there was only 612 and not 613, if God left out Ben Soreru More, I think we'll be okay. We would still have enough to learn for the rest of our lives, for the rest of eternity. So what exactly is this message? Oh, we, we want to give you something to learn because we want to give you a reward. I have the rest of Shas to learn. There's enough reward everywhere else. You could leave this out. I still have enough to learn. What's going on? Of course, our rabbis explain that the reward is not the reward of learning Torah. Of course, there's all of Shas. We could learn Torah for the rest of our lives. We'll have our hands full. But the reward is the Sachar of when we study things like this, Perashiyot like this, topics like this, we learn other valuable lessons about life about being parents, we, about, we understand children, we learn about being better people. That's the reward. We walk away with valuable lessons. And so today, um, if we could just maybe touch a couple of lessons, okay? Important lessons that we learn. Today we're going to derosh, expound, and then benefit from this topic that never happened. Lessons from the topic that never happened, from an episode that will never happen ever. But we're learning lessons today. One lesson. Here we go. Number one. What does it mean, ben sorer umore? Anyone want to translate the words? Because there, the name, by the way, this topic is discussed at length in the Gemara, in Masechet Sanhedrin, in a chapter that's called, take a guess, who wants to guess what the chapter's title is? And it's a three-word title. Very good. Ben Soreru More. That's the name of the chapter. What does it mean? Ben Soreru More means the son, the child, who is Sorer, wayward, Umore. Anyone know what's More? More means to rebel. Okay, as an example. Moshe said, Shim'u naham morim. Listen, you rebels. Okay? So there is a child who is sorer, who is wayward, who is defiant. And more means he rebels. Let me ask you a question. Which one usually comes first? The rebelling? Or the defiant? Being defiant. Which one comes first? Being sorer or more? Usually the order is more, he rebels. And then he does his own thing. So really, the name itself is problematic. What does it mean? Ben sorer u more. Sorer, he, he's wayward. And then more, it should have been Ben more u sorer. He's rebelling. And that led him to sorer. That led him to be defiant. First you rebel and then you're defiant. Why is it written in the opposite order? 
Another question, how in the world could the Torah even think about letting us kill this kid? Again, it never happened. But what's even, like we say in the Gemara, what's the Hava Amina? What's even the, the thought to think that you could do it? What happened to Teshuvah? Kids change. <laughs> all, all the time. Can you imagine you see a 13-year-old kid that's doing bad things? You say, oh, that's it. He's hopeless. What, you, you could rule him out forever? 13, I know many 13-year-olds that were very bad and they ended up becoming very good. People change. People do teshuvah. People repent. How could we write them off right away at the age of 13? What happened to t- repentance? How could we judge a kid from, you know, it's a teenager? Nothing. He's a little kid. He's immature. He's going to change. And Rabbi Bernstein says something beautiful. More could mean to rebel. But you know what else more can mean? More also means. What does more mean? Anyone know? Mora, a teacher. Very good. More is a teacher. This kid is Sorer, but he's also a teacher. What is he teaching? Who is he teaching? Who can he teach? He can't teach anybody. He's not in a position to, to be a teacher. And that's the problem. The problem is not that he's sorer. It's one thing that you're, you're rebelling. Okay, you're wayward. You're rebellious, fine. But the problem is that you're more. More is to teach. The problem of this kid is that he's not just doing the wrong thing, but he actually is now justifying his wrong ways. He is now becoming a teacher, explaining and koshering why what he's doing is actually nothing wrong with it. And that's where you run into a problem. It's one thing in life to have flaws. We make mistakes. We all have issues. We have bad midot. We're impatient. We're stubborn. We have anger issues. We sin. We eat things that we shouldn't. We talk ways that we shouldn't. We act in ways that we shouldn't. Okay. We all have our problems. Nobody's perfect. And a person does teshuvah. And Hashem is patient. But the most dangerous thing is when you not only do the wrong thing, but when we start justifying and we turn our ways into an ideology. Once my sin is not a sin, once my sin is actually okay, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. And this is something that we so often run into. You know, we all agree that people need to do better, people need to change. But if I, if I asked you, if someone asked us, okay, fine, how about you right now, you? What do you need to change? What do you need to do better today? Which mistakes are you making in your life right now? Where are we rebelling? Where are we sorer? I challenge you right now, if you're listening to a recording, pause the video. Or if it's not a recording, just stop for a second and ask yourself, what mistake am I making in my life right now? I don't know. I'm doing great. See, that's the problem. We think we're doing great. So long that we think that our lives are perfect. And again, it could be we're doing amazing. We should think that we're doing amazing. We are doing great. Baruch Hashem. But we can't find one thing that we need to change. Do we not speak Lashon Hara? I don't know. The people that I speak about, it's probably the mitzvah to speak about them. Because they're bad people. (laughs) The foods that I eat, there's nothing wrong with them. I hold it okay. So long that I am more and I can justify why I am doing the sins that I'm doing, I will never change. And that's where we run into a problem. I have many times students that they tell me, Rabbi, I eat this food, I do this on Shabbat. I tell them, listen, it's okay. You're struggling and you're working on yourself. 
That's fine. But what I cannot tolerate is when a kid says to me, Rabbi, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing this on Shabbat. These foods that I eat, Rabbi, there's nothing wrong with going to that restaurant. What could be wrong? I tell them all the time, listen, you want to eat there? That's fine, eat there. But don't more, don't start becoming a teacher and allowing it. Because then there's no chance that you'll ever change. There's no chance that we'll ever stop. Stop what? Stop why? What am I doing wrong? Everything that I'm doing is actually perfectly well. I'm a tzaddik. Halavai, everyone could be like me. This restaurant is great. These items on Shabbat are fine to do. The way I talk is, that's not a curse. Lying? I don't lie. No, I joke. It's okay. I, I say white lies. That's nothing wrong. To lie and to cheat on taxes? It's mutar. It's, they, you know how much money they take from me? So I take from them. So long that we think like that, we are more. And again, I hope I'm not hurting anybody right now. I apologize if I am. But sometimes Musar hurts. Sometimes real Musar, ethics and self-help, it's uncomfortable. We have to start getting to the point that we realize, you know what? And that's the first step of Teshuvah. What's the first step? <clears throat> to be makir beheto. That's what we do, vidui. Vidui is to confess. All year round, we justify our sins. It's not a problem. It's not a sin. I'm not doing anything wrong. And we have a lot of excuses. Either it's okay, or it's not me. It's how I was raised. This is what my father, my mother, this is what they used to eat. This is where my parents, this is how they kept Shabbat. This is how my parents spoke. This is how my father acted. It wasn't me. This is how society, today, it's normal. You ever heard that word? Normal. Today, Rabbi, this is normal today. That's how everyone talks. That's what everyone does. It's not even an issue anymore. Right? And that's what vidui is. Vidui, we say, Al het shehatanu lefanecha. God, I'm done justifying. I'm finished rationalizing my mistakes. I do that all year round. But once a year, I gotta confess. And I have to actually say it the way it is. I am speaking not the right way. I curse too much. I'm talking like Shonara, God. And then you know what? I'm going to say it how it is. I'm guilty. That's the first step. Whether or not we change, but at least we were admitting. All these people that I don't like, this person that I'm going to fight with, all year round I justify and I kosher and I idealize why it's okay. I'm allowed to fight with them because they did this to me. And, I'm, and all the Lashon Hara that I speak against them is permitted. I make it into a, my, I, I make my own Torah. That's one of the Viduim we say in the confession, in the long one. We say, I got rid of your Torah and I created my own. I created my own set of laws. We're not just saying I sinned. It's one thing to sin, but at least I sinned, and I'm sorry, God, that I did it. I shouldn't have. Uh, listen, I'm tempted. It's good food. It's nice to talk like that. It's hard to keep Shabbat. It's hard to keep Tzaniyut. So, all right. I know I shouldn't, but, I, but whatever. I'm not there yet. If a person says that, that's a very high level, you should know. To be able to say the words, I shouldn't be doing this. Problem is that Yetzirah doesn't stop there. He usually wants us to not even realize that it's a problem. He wants us to more 
and to teach everybody around us why this is actually great, why it's beautiful what I do. This is fine. This is fine. And again, everybody has their own things. Everybody's on their own level. But at least once a year, Rabotai, at least as we're entering Rosh Hashanah, let us sit down and find out, you know what? I'm doing it. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop, honestly. I'm going to keep watching these things. I'm going to keep eating these things. But at least let me say it's wrong. Once a year, let me confess, God. You know what? I admit it's wrong. I may not stop. But all year round, I'm rationalizing. All year round, I'm justifying. Today, I admit, Hashem, that it's not good. Today, I recognize and I am in sync with your Torah. Your Torah is my Torah. I may not keep it, but at least I recognize that is the law. That's a very, very important level. The reason this kid gets killed, and again, it never happened, but even on a conceptual level, the reason the Torah even thinks about killing him is because he became a more. And the Torah is teaching us something very important. If we are more, if we turn our sins into an ideology, if our sins are not even sins and they're okay, there's no chance we'll ever return. We'll never stop. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from Har Sinai. And God says to him, Moshe, you better go quick. They're doing an egil. They're dancing around the golden calf. They're doing the Yehita egil. Which is what? They're bowing down. Abu Dazara. Okay. He quickly goes down and he sees the egil. And he takes the tablets and he smashes them. Breaks the luchot. Why did he break them? They don't deserve it. Okay. Very nice. They don't deserve it. He breaks them. Makes sense? Makes sense. You know what the problem is? You know what doesn't make sense? Why did you even bring them down the mountain to begin with? If they don't deserve it, then the second God tells Moshe they're doing the Egel, Moshe should say, okay, here you go, God. I'm returning the tablets. Keep them up here. They don't deserve it. But he doesn't do that. Moshe brings them because he feels that they still do deserve the, the tablets for some reason. So then what changed? If they deserved it when you brought them down and you knew they did the Egil, then why when all of a sudden you see the Egil, all of a sudden they don't deserve it? Did you doubt Hashem was telling the truth? This is a question, very good question that the commentaries discuss. Now I always, whenever I say over this Advar Torah, I always start with my son's answer. You should know, I asked this question one time on my Shabbat table. My son, he's eight, but this story happened two years ago when he was six maybe last year when he was seven, my son said an answer that was profound. Beautiful answer. It's unbelievable, by the way, how brilliant our children can be. They can really, they have so much wisdom and insight that we don't even know. We think they're small, young, dumb. They're not. My son said an answer. I love it. Not because my son, I think you'll love it too. He said that the reason Moshe didn't break it up there is because it's not nice. Hashem gave you a gift. It's inappropriate to break it right in front of him. Go away and break it somewhere else. Someone gives you a gift. You don't like the gift? Happy birthday. I got you a shaver. You have five. Wow. Oh my God, a shaver. I really needed this. Make believe. Make him feel good. When you turn around, you throw it out. But don't be like, oh, wow, another shaver. Thank you. I, yeah, I'm sure I'll use this if the other five break one day. Yeah, thank you. Make the guy feel good. Someone gets you something. You don't like it. Make believe. Okay? That was my son's answer. But, but, the Seforno, Seforno, 
commentary on the Torah, he says another answer. And he says something beautiful also. Moshe heard, the, God tells Moshe they're doing the Egil. Moshe could tolerate that. They're sinning. That's fine. People sin. <laughs> We're not perfect. No one here never sinned. Impossible. We all sin. God, by the way, knows we're going to sin. If he wanted us to not sin, then that's called an angel. He didn't create angels. He created people that have mistakes. We make mistakes. We sin. Moshe says, okay, they're doing the Yegel, God. What do you think? That we're going to stay perfect forever? I'm going to go give him a little, you know, slap on the wrist. I'm going to give them a schmooze. I'm going to give them some nice fiery speech. Talk some sense back into them. And uh, we'll, we'll continue. Moshe is not nervous that they're doing the Egel. People do the Egel. They do Abu Dazara. Is it a bad sin? Yes. Very bad. Horrible. Should they not have done it 100%? People sin. Okay. We, we, we get up. We move forward. Weiter, like they say in Arabic. <laughs> it's not Arabic. Just in case if you were wondering. It's uh, okay. Either way. It's, uh, it's Yiddish, okay? Weiter, we move forward! But you know what Moshe didn't know? When he gets down the mountain, says the Seforno, he sees the Egel, but he sees the Mcholot, the dancing around it. The dancing he was unaware of. You see, it's one thing to do the Egel, you sin, okay, you, f you, you, you fight with yourself, you struggle, you get better, hopefully next time we won't. But once you're dancing around your sin, once we re get to the point that we're able to turn our sins into a song, once we're proud of them, once they become good, once we turn them into mitzvot, we'll never return, we'll never stop. Stop from what? It's a song. I'm dancing. It's beautiful. My sins are not sins. They're mitzvot. Then we'll never stop. Rabbi, if you ask me, I think Hashem doesn't care about X, Y, and Z. That's very dangerous to say. Because then why should you ever stop doing it? There's no need to stop. It's actually a good thing. Hashem doesn't care about it. The first step of Teshuvah is to recognize that we're making a mistake. Throughout the year, we're dancing around our sins. And again, everyone on a different level, you have them, I have them. There are certain things that I do maybe that I don't really think it's so bad. Everyone on their own level. But we have to, once a year at least, be man enough and stand up and to stop dancing around our eggels. We have to stop justifying. We have to stop rationalizing. We have to stop more. We have to stop teaching people and myself that what I'm doing is actually fine. That's the danger of this kid. Not that he's a sorer. Many wayward people. The problem is the next word. That he's a more. That he became a rebbe. Once he's a rabbi and he started his own cult and his own yeshiva and his own system and it's now fine, mutarim lachem, mutarim lachem, it's okay. Once we think that what we're doing is okay, there is no point, there is no hope of ever stopping, of ever returning. So this is, I think, a very important lesson. Again, did it ever happen? This case never happened. Never will happen. But the Gemara says, Derosh Vekabel Sachar. Study it well. There's a lot of lessons. And I think this is a very valuable lesson, especially in, again in this time of Elul, where we're entering the zone of Teshuvah, to be able to be honest with ourselves. At least, if not now, Rabotai, then when? This is it. This is the month of Elul. We have to, in the last month of the year, to think about what are things in my day that I'm doing. Maybe I could stop. Maybe things that I should start doing that I don't think I need to. Again, whether it's actions, maybe they're midot, characters that we have, deficiencies. We should be zoche to um, take this first step together, to admit, and then we'll be able to uh, have our teshuvah fully accepted 
making one step closer uh, in our Teshuvah process to Avinu Sheba Shemaim. We'll stop over here. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.